It seems that everywhere I go, everyone that I run into, they're all looking for peace. They're looking for peace in relationship with others. They're looking for uh, inner peace. They're looking for peace in their relationship with God. They're looking for world peace. Everybody, everywhere, is looking for peace. So are the shepherds. Verse 14 of our scripture passage. The declaration is made to these shepherds and to us. Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. Peace. Peace is that inner feeling, both emotional and spiritual, of calm and joy that goes beyond the external circumstances of our life. And all we need is a little rumbling in the external circumstances of our life, and wow, sometimes that inner peace is challenged. Inner peace is what Jesus Christ came to give us. And I I think it's true because all of our life is not calm and bright, we could use a little peace. And the Bible points out that, well, peace radiates from the person who knows who they are and the person who has the, the right or the best priorities in life. Let's talk about who we are. Who are you? Have you noticed that if you ask a man, you know, who are you? We we will often tell you what we do or what we did for a living. And we're very good at defining who we really are by what we've accomplished or what we're good at. Perhaps on the other side, women have a tendency to define themselves in relationship to their children and what their children do. I now have a new designation. I I didn't know this, but I discovered it the other day very clearly. When I go to the high school, I am now Grace's father. Right? That's her world, and when I go there, some girl went, look, there's Grace's dad the other day. We're often defined, and often define, who we are by what we do. And the truth is, is we're not who we think we are. We are not who others think that we are. Who we really are, we are who God says we are. And God says that we are His children. That He loves us. And He wants us to be very much a part of His family. Listen to Ephesians 4, 5. God decided in advance, that's interesting, isn't it? We're always thinking we're the ones that got this God thing all going on. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that God takes a step towards you. And because He's taken a step towards you, you can respond by taking a step towards Him. He did that in advance to adopt us into His own family by bringing us to Himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. Christmas reminds us that it gives God great pleasure to include us in his family. 
that he wants us to be in a love relationship with him that perhaps is best defined by a a parent-child relationship, a family relationship. God's goal is not to exclude us. God's goal is to include us. The Christmas message is that God wanted to include the shepherds. Now, in the past couple of weeks, we talked about the fact that Jesus was the Messiah, that all the Jews were expecting it. But even in the Christmas story, we realize that Although the Jews are the chosen people, Jesus Christ came to include everybody, even the Gentiles, even the shepherds out in the field. He wants to include all of us. That's the Christmas message. And He wants to include all of us because He loves us. You can really summarize the Christmas message as a God who loves us and wants to include us in His family. Add to Ephesians 4, 5, Jeremiah 31, 3. I have loved you with an everlasting love. And then Ephesians 4, 4. God had already chosen us to be His through our union with Christ Because of His love. We can be a part of His family because of His love. And how was He to show His love more profoundly than sending His one and only Son to this planet? He did that so that, well, we'd feel included So that we would experience His love. That's the message that, well, frankly, not everybody is hearing any longer. It used to be that churches kind of swelled a little bit during the Christmas season. You know, there were those people that, ah, they didn't go to church very often, but they never missed on Christmas and Easter. Well, I can tell you now... That generation has had children and they don't come to church on Christmas or Easter. I I know where they are, but they're not in church. And because they're not in church, they're really not hearing the Christmas message. They're not hearing about a God that loves them, about a God that wants to have them be a part of their Uh, of his family. And you've heard me talk about that. I think they have to be invited to be a part of our family before they can really hear that God wants them to be a part of his family. And so we've got to take the message out there. We've got to be spiritual tour guides for people at Christmas time and Bring them to where the message is. Because we all know they really want to hear the message. We know that they really need to hear the message. Because we all need to know that God loves us. We all want to hear that we can be a part of His family. Because being a part of God's family is very special. There are privileges that are ours and securities that are ours because we're children of God. You ever known a, a child of privilege? I've known, I've known several. One of my uh, good friends, he had the privilege of his dad being the, uh, the Frito-Lay delivery guy. We don't often think about that being a great privilege, but I can tell you what, there was always potato chips at that guy's house. Always. Right? If you're not a person of privilege, you want to have a friend who is, right? And it's interesting that as Christians, that as 
children of God, we often live below our privilege. How could we summarize that privilege? Well, that privilege really is summarized well for us in John 10.10. That we can have a fullness to our life. Jesus says, my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Now, when we talk about peace and that as a component of a rich and fulfilling life, that begs the question, okay, how come we're not completely at peace? We've got worries, right? We're like the shepherds in the field. We've got fears. We have concerns. We have anxiety. And that's clearly interfering with this fulfilling life. Why do we have those anxieties? I I can't really speak for you, but I can speak for myself. There's a little relationship in the Bible that's very interesting about why I fear or have anxiety. It's interesting to read in Matthew that Jesus says nothing is impossible for God. And then in Luke, he says nothing is impossible for us. If nothing is impossible for God, and nothing is impossible for us, then why am I fearful? Why am I worried? Why am I filled with stress? And I I know you are during the Christmas season. Even though it is a a happier time of life, I, I... I'm carrying on the conversations with people about, uh, you know, why they're stressed out or worried or even depressed during the Christmas season. And it's interesting that does relate to, well, whether we're living up to our privilege as God's people. It relates to the fact that we think somehow something is impossible for God Or we think something's impossible for us. And there's a great privilege that we have as children of God. We are our Father. Nothing is impossible for Him. We always believe that about our fathers when they're little. Right? Isn't that true? Except my son. He was talking to one of his little friends Uh, when he was about five or six, and he says, yeah, my dad's a doctor, but he can't fix anybody. (laughs) Nothing is impossible for God. We're going to talk about that when we get to Romans, but if God is calling you to do something, nothing will get in the way of that. If we stay living our life according to his purpose. Why fear? Why have anxiety? Why be stressed out? And and I know we all are about certain things. We need to believe that nothing is impossible for God. We have to trust that because of his desire to give us a fulfilling life, that nothing is impossible for us. That's our privilege as his children. There are also certain securities. I, I have a few friends. They never have to worry about buying anything for the rest of their lives. And, they, and they've been that way uh, for many, many years. In fact, a, a friend of mine in California was the youngest millionaire in the state of California. His father signed over the family business to he and his brother, who's two years older than he is, and instantaneously he became a multimillionaire. In the, and he, Mike never has to worry about anything he wants to buy, anything he wants to do. Wow. That's security, isn't it? Well, it is to some things. 
but not necessarily the other things. When it comes to security, I think our, our greatest fear is fear about the other side. When we die, isn't it? That is the true common fear of humanity because we're all a little worried about what's going to happen after we die. And isn't it interesting that God wants to bring us some security about that? It is John 3.16, isn't it? For God loved the world so much that He gave His one and only Son so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. See, there are privileges in this life because we're a part of God's family and there is a security that we know where we're headed when we die. That we can and will spend eternity with God because God is our Father. John 3.16 says we have to believe. That's a very interesting word to study, belief. I'll give you a simple way of under, understanding belief today. Belief simply is one, it's faith in the facts. And when it comes to the little baby Jesus, there's lots of facts. We know that Jesus was born. We know that Jesus grew up and he carried out his ministry we know that, that he was crucified, that he was buried in a tomb, that he resurrected three days later, and then he walked around a little bit like you and I, and he was seen and recognized by over 500 people. That is a historical fact. We know about the, the growth of the church. We know about changed lives, our own changed life. That's proof. That's a fact, isn't it? There are lots of good facts, and we don't believe many times because we don't know the facts. We think everybody knows the facts about Jesus. They don't anymore. anymore. That's not a good assumption. I don't assume that people know about Jesus and I don't assume that they read and, and trust the Bible as God's word any longer. I often assume just the opposite. They don't know who Jesus is and they don't know much about this book. And, and the truth is, is you've got to learn some things. There is some head knowledge to have. There are some facts to gather in so that we will really have a reasonable amount of trust in the facts that we know. Now, I'm really bad at fixing things around my house. Uh, I, I can build a couple of things if they're pretty simple to do, but I can tell you the thing I really don't like to mess with, and that's anything electrical. Yeah, I can change a light bulb, I've even changed out a socket, and yes, I did turn off the breaker first. But really, other than that, you know, I'll tell you how I'm a simpleton. I go to the light switch, and I turn it on. I don't know who wired my house. I don't know how they wired my house. I know this. I go to the light switch, and I turn it on, and the lights come on. I have to trust all the rest of it. How do I know that my trust is true and not just a blind trust? Because when I go to the switch and I flip it up, it turns the Christmas tree on. We need those facts, but we're never going to know all the facts. I, I became a Christian right before my freshman year in college. I was 17 years old. I'm 57 now, been a pastor for over 30 years. I can tell you what, I still don't know how Jesus was total God and total man. I don't, I don't know how he, I know he has to have been total God, but I can't tell you how he did it. I know it wasn't smoke and mirrors. I know it's not just some 
uh, you know, theologian's idea. He had to be God and man. But I can't explain it to you, so that's an area that I have to what? Trust. And then finally, we have to act. We have to step out on faith. I do know a lot of people, the Christmas message is just an intellectual thing. They know a lot of things about Jesus, but they don't personally know Jesus. And yeah, the the greatest distance in the universe is the two and a half feet from your head to your heart. And yes, there are some facts to know, but being a child of God is a personal emotional, loving experience, because love is a feeling, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And isn't it interesting, we don't feel secure about life, about death, about heaven. And the reason for that is is we're really not secure in our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We need to personally experience the God we believe in. We've got to know Him personally. That's what the Christmas message is all about. Is we can know God personally because He came to this planet. And I know it's outlandish to think about an infinite God who created the universe being a little baby in a in a manger to parents who were common carpenters at a very inopportune time. Some little tiny obscure town. But that's what God did to communicate His love. To communicate the fact that He wants us to be a part of His family. Peace often radiates from the person who has the the right priorities. And Christmas lets us know those right priorities, doesn't it? It's interesting, everybody in the Christmas scene understood the priority and the preeminence of Jesus. Maybe the only person that didn't was the innkeeper. But everybody else understood, right? The shepherds in the field. Isn't it interesting how they respond? They didn't say, well, look, angels. You know, we just got all these sheep to sleep. And we're a little tired ourselves. Right? And you know, tomorrow we got to take them, because they ate all the grass here today. We're going to have to take them up to the hills and, and, and feed them. And you know what? Maybe after we get them up, get ourselves up, take them up, Then if we've got some time, you know, we need bread anyway. We're going to go to town. Why we're there, hey, maybe we'll see the baby Jesus. Man, that's not how they, John the Baptist, or anyone else responded to the baby Jesus. They went, the Bible says, immediately. Immediately. They made Jesus Christ not just a priority, but at least in that moment, they made Him the priority in their life. And I'll just simply ask you, this Christmas season, what's your number one priority? What's your number one priority? Christmas is a tough time to ask that question. Because lots of things become very important to us at Christmas time. We've got presents to buy and wrap or pay somebody else to wrap. That's a smart thing to do. We've got celebrations to go to. I, I, I can tell you, I, I'm, I'm starting to get a little celebrated out. The last two nights I haven't gotten to bed until 11 o'clock. And I'm getting old enough I need to be in bed sooner than that. 
Last night at 10, I was still dancing away with my wife, having a good time. Family relationships. Those that are without this Christmas season. All sorts of things are very important to us. And I'm not saying that none of those... And there's nothing on that list that shouldn't be important to us. But what should be most important to us? Jesus should be most important to us. The reason for that is... Jesus is where we receive the inner peace that we're looking for. You go back to John 3.16 and it says, whoever believes. Who's number one? In fact, I, I gave you a little list. It's interesting that Jesus is already the Lord of everything but your life if he's not. Isn't that interesting to think about? The Bible says that he's the Lord of all creation it says that he is the Lord over the angels and the heavenly realms. That he's even the Lord of, over evil. He's the Lord of this earth. The only question is whether he's going to be the Lord of our life, whether we're going to let him be the leader of our life, as I like to say, or whether we're going to keep living our lives the way that we want to live them. And as I've mentioned to you, we're all very selfish when it comes to that. We want to be in charge of our life. And usually it isn't until we crash and burn a couple of times that we finally wake up and say, you know, I'm not doing too good at leading my own life. And then we're ready to give Jesus a shot. Okay. You can lead my life, let's just see how that goes. It's interesting that he needs to be number one. And as I've talked about it, it's, it's interesting that, that what we want to do is we want a little slice of Jesus sometimes at Christmas time. Right? You know, we like the gift giving, even doing the tree thing. And, oh yeah, we gather together with our neighbors and, you know, we have some special eggnog. And all of that's really good, right? And we want a slice of Christmas, but we need to realize that the Christmas message is that it's not about an alteration in our life. It's not just about a slice. It's about the whole pie. As I talked about last week, it really is about a, a, a first order paradigm shift in your life. To say that you only want a little of Jesus is a little bit like saying only part of your body is going to run. <laughs> Does that work? Can, can you do that? Can only part of your body? No. If you're going to run, the whole body's got to run. If you want to have Christ be the leader of your life, then you've got to let him lead every aspect, every dimension, every relationship. And simply, what bad is going to happen if you let Jesus Christ be the leader of your life? What would happen if every day in your year was like Christmas Day? What bad thing would that cause in your life? Let's look at Romans chapter 8. It's a great verse. Paul says, And we know that God causes everything to work for good for those who love God and called according to His purpose for them. Everything works for good. Wow. What are you worried about? What are you stressed out about? You're worried and stressed out about something that you think is not going to work out, or at least that's what happens to me. And the proof is, is that 
God doesn't even waste the painful things that have happened to you. This verse doesn't say, okay, if I let Jesus be the leader of my life, then only good things are going to happen. No. What it's declaring is, is that when difficult or painful, unjust things happen to, to you in life, those are not wasted. That somehow, some way, God is going to use that for good in your life, and many times He's going to use that for good in the life of someone else. Who better to comfort someone else in the loss of a loved one than someone who's been through that grief and that pain? Who better to support someone who struggles with addiction in their life than someone else who has struggled through addiction in their life? God uses everything. He's working everything out for good. For those who what? Love Him. And yes, those who are called according to His purpose. Now you can go in your own way. Listen only to your own little inner voice. And and you'll probably find yourself in a little bit of trouble along the way. And that might not work out all that well. If you don't look both ways when you cross the street out here, when we're through, that could create some problems for you. But see, when we love God and we're living to the best of our ability in accordance with His will, it's amazing how things work out. It's amazing how we have a greater peace in our life. Why? Because we understand our privilege And we understand our security. And I am convinced, Paul writes, that nothing can separate us from God's love. And at the core, that's really what we struggle with, isn't it? Because we know we're sinners. We know we're imperfect. Yeah, it's the holidays, but have you ever noticed that somewhere along in the holidays, things get a little ugly? We get a little anxious, we get a little mad, we get a little frustrated. Sometimes in the holidays, our worst self comes out, not our best self. And when it does, yeah, we look ourselves in the mirror and say, oh, well, you know, how could God love me? You know, when I'm like that, I don't even love myself. How can God love me? And that's the Christmas story, that He loves us unconditionally. He loves you unconditionally. There are things that my children do that I don't love, but that doesn't mean I've stopped loving them. And Jesus says, man, if a human dad can do that, just imagine how your heavenly Father loves you. And at Christmas time, we, we begin to get our arms around that, don't we? That nothing can separate us from God's love. And that's the way it should be. Because God's love is unconditional. God's love is filled with grace. God's love lasts for all eternity. That is very worthy of of our celebration at Christmas time. Let us pray. Lord, you know where we fear, where we're worried, where we're anxious, where we're, where we're living below the privilege of being your children. And Lord, that's because On the one hand, we think something is impossible for you. And on the other hand, we think something's impossible for us. But Lord, if you've taken care of eternity, you are very capable of taking care of our temporal life. And so Lord, we want to offer 
that worry, that fear, that stress, that concern to you. Lord, we ask that you would work everything out for good. Lord, we'll know that that's because of your love. Our desire to respond and love to you. Lord, it's because of your purpose and our desire to line up our will to the best of our ability with your will. To let you lead our life. Lord, that every day in our life might be like Christmas Day. Lord, thank you for being that kind of a loving and gracious God. And so we pray in your name. Amen.